Hello everyone. Before we continue with our lectures on the history of music and art, we'll be listening to Michael's presentation on how music and art are being used to help with the healing process in the 21st century. Michael, are you ready to begin? Uh, yes, I think so. Thanks, Professor. Right, uh, good morning all. As Professor McKinley just stated, I've been doing some research into the healing powers of art and music, and I'd like to present my findings to you today. I intend to demonstrate the positive effects of music and art on patients' emotional, social, as well as physical well-being. Let's begin by going back in time to the most famous of nurses, Florence Nightingale. Way back in 1860, Florence Nightingale wrote in her Notes on Nursing that brightly coloured flowers and art helped her patients to recover more quickly. Although her comments were viewed with scepticism at the time, she was, we believe, the first of many health professionals to state this. Over the following years, there were many other studies that tried to prove that a link between art, music and health exists. But very few of them were strictly controlled, so the results were variable and therefore unreliable. However, one American study was different. In the 1980s, some research took place into the effects of architecture on the recovery time of 46 patients who were in hospital for a gallbladder operation. Half of the patients were kept in hospital wards with windows overlooking some trees. The other half were left in rooms that faced onto a brick wall. It was found that the ones with a nice view left hospital a day earlier and needed fewer painkillers. This study was groundbreaking, as it was the first that used controlled conditions that could be measured statistically and without bias. Now I'd like to bring you up to date and take a closer comparative look at three research projects on three very different types of patient. The first monitored the health of unborn babies. In the study which took place at a hospital in London, babies were played live music and their heart rates were monitored. A healthy baby's heart would beat around 110 to 160 times a minute but researchers found that their heart rate increased by up to 15 beats a minute on average without the mother's pulse changing. This is a good sign that the baby is healthy. In addition, the mothers that took part in the survey also said they felt more relaxed. Another study looked at cancer patients who were visiting as day patients to receive their chemotherapy treatments. They were treated in a room that had artistic pictures hanging on the wall. The pictures were changed each week so that the patients would not have to look at the same ones week after week. When questioned afterwards, patients said that they felt less pain because the images helped take their mind off the treatment they were receiving. They also noted general improvements in their well-being. Finally, the last study analysed the treatment of a group of elderly patients who were in hospital to have a hip replacement operation and so they needed to stay for around 10 to 14 days. The researchers played them 30-minute tracks of soothing classical music, but not every day, and then monitored their progress using a questionnaire. When asked to rate how they felt both with and without music, the patients consistently stated that they felt less anxious on the days when they had the music playing. There was a second, unexpected, but completely understandable result from the research. The staff liked the music so much that they said they too felt happier and that they would be less likely to leave the hospital for a job elsewhere if it were to continue. Now that has to be a good thing, which will also have a positive effect on the quality of the treatment patients receive. Good afternoon and welcome to Insect Biology 101. I'd like to begin this course with a few remarks about good insects and bad ones. Bugs are all around us and that's both a benefit and an annoyance. Sometimes maybe even serious harm. First, let's talk about the good things that insects do for us. Probably the most important insect for humans, and maybe for all other life, is the bee. 
Bees help plants in the process of pollination, and thus are necessary to most flowers and fruit-producing trees. That is, they carry pollen from male flowers to female. If it weren't for bees, we'd have very few food plants and no fruit either. In fact, there would be no we. No lesser thinker than Albert Einstein pointed out that, without bees, humanity would be dead within a year or less. We'd starve. It's that simple. That should maybe make us just a little humble. A little less dramatic is the fact that bees also make the honey we eat. Moreover, they produce beeswax, which is useful in candles, and is also used as a first-rate furniture polish. Sure, these may not be vital to our lives, but they can serve as reminders of how important bees are. That's a point I keep coming back to in this course. Though, in all fairness, I should point out that butterflies aid in pollination as well as bees. Now, here in Michigan, what's the worst part of summer? Yep, that's right, mosquitoes. But I'm talking about helpful insects, right? So let's look at the dragonfly first. If there were no dragonflies, there would be even more mosquitoes. Dragonflies mainly eat mosquitoes and also a few other insects. Yes, that's right. They don't just fly around, and they also help to eliminate harmful insects. So the next time you see a dragonfly, don't you dare kill it. Now let's talk a little about those harmful insects. Take the mosquitoes I just mentioned as an example. Not so many years ago, mosquitoes here in America weren't just annoying; some were even deadly. They carried malaria and yellow fever. My own ancestor, the Confederate General John Bell Hood, lived through the worst battles of Civil War, only to die at age 38 from yellow fever. A pest, not a bullet. Well, besides the mosquitoes, in summer there is also a kind of insect that never seems tired. Right, that is the fly. Before I go on talking, I must mention an African fly called the tsetse fly, which feeds on blood and can cause serious diseases in the people and animals that it bites. Besides, it is still a bearer of sleeping sickness, which affects around 300,000 people every year in Africa, and can be treated only with toxic drugs that are hard to administer. Worse still, the drugs sometimes don't work. Other insects, of course, destroy food crops. In China, for instance, locusts continue to be a danger to the harvest in some areas. Less important but still annoying, moths eat people's clothes and dust mites slowly destroy carpets. Worse but still in the home, termites or white ants eat wood, the wood of your house. If they are not stopped, they can eventually destroy the whole building. Usually, they seriously damage a building before anyone even notices them. So, as we all know, insects can be a real trouble. So, what to do? You can go ahead and start killing harmful insects. In the early decades after the communist revolution in China, Chairman Mao encouraged the people to swat every fly they could see. Slogans on the walls of buildings called them "little capitalists," but flies reproduce too quickly for this to be a long-term solution. For some decades in the West, to kill insects with chemicals seemed a good remedy. Unfortunately, chemicals can only be used in a limited area for a limited time. It's a small-scale solution. The insects come back. Worse still, some of the poisons used, like DDT, were found harmful to the environment. Many kinds of wildlife, like hawks, were harmed. And people in chemical-using rural areas have one of the highest rates of liver cancer in the world. It's no secret that chemicals remain harmful to humans. Like all species, insects adapt to their changing environments at an amazing rate. When a new chemical is introduced to their habitat, the insects that survive are generally the ones with some way of resisting the harmful effects. They then breed with the other survivors, and just like that, insects become resistant to most poison in a few generations. An insect generation, remember, is a couple of months at most. So again, we have to ask, what to do? Well, there are biological solutions. Some of these are pretty simple. One is destroying the insect's habitat. You take away their home or food. Cleaning your kitchen is the best way to prevent roaches. No garbage, no food. Getting rid of marshes and swamps eliminates mosquitoes. Other solutions might include bringing in dragonflies or bats in areas where mosquitoes are many. This is a cheaper alternative to chemicals. Biological methods like this also bring no extra pollution to the environment. But you have to be careful. If you change the environment too much, you might be hurting other forms of life accidentally. One recent method of controlling insect populations involves interrupting their breeding cycle. What does that mean? It means birth control for bugs. Insects are provided with food that makes them unable to reproduce. Since they can't have babies, the population disappears, or nearly so. And since no young are born, resistance is not a problem. With no young insects developing increased resistance, interrupt the life cycle, eliminate the bug. It's clear that we must have an understanding of the life cycle of the insect. At least that's the plan. We'll go into more detail as the course goes along. Now I will stop here to see whether you have any questions or not. I'm going to be talking about time. Specifically, I'll be looking at how people think about time and how these time perspectives structure our lives. According to social psychologists, there are six ways of thinking about time, 
which are called personal time zones. The first two are based in the past. Past positive thinkers spend most of their time in a state of nostalgia, fondly remembering moments such as birthdays, marriages, and important achievements in their life. These are the kinds of people who keep family records, books, and photo albums. People living in the past negative time zone are also absorbed by earlier times, but they focus on all the bad things, regrets, failures, poor decisions. They spend a lot of time thinking about how life could have been. Then we have people who live in the present. Present hedonists are driven by pleasure and immediate sensation. Their life motto is to have a good time and avoid pain. Present fatalists live in the moment too, but they believe this moment is the product of circumstances entirely beyond their control. It's their fate, whether it's poverty, religion, or society itself. Something stops these people from believing they can play a role in changing their outcomes in life. Life simply is, and that's that. Looking at the future time zone, we can see that people classified as future active are the planners and go-getters. They work rather than play. And resist temptation. Decisions are made based on potential consequences, not on the experience itself. A second future-oriented perspective, future fatalistic, is driven by the certainty of life after death and some kind of a judgment day when they will be assessed on how virtuously they have lived and what success they have had in their lives. Okay, let's move on. You might ask, how do these time zones affect our lives? Let's start at the beginning. Everyone is brought into this world as a present hedonist. No exceptions. Our initial needs and demands—to be warm, secure, fed, and watered—all stem from the present moment. But things change when we enter formal education. We're taught to stop existing in the moment and to begin thinking about future outcomes. But did you know that every nine seconds a child in the USA drops out of school? For boys, the rate is much higher than for girls. We could easily say, "Ah, well, boys just aren't as bright as girls." But the evidence doesn't support this. A recent study states that boys in America, by the age of 21, have spent 10,000 hours playing video games. The research suggests that they'll never fit in the traditional classroom because these boys require a situation where they have the ability to manage their own learning environment. Now, let's look at the way we do prevention education. All prevention education is aimed at a future time zone. We say, "Don't smoke, or you'll get cancer." Get good grades, or you won't get a good job. But with present-oriented kids, that just doesn't work. Although they understand the potentially negative consequences of their actions, they persist with the behavior because they're not living for the future. They're in the moment right now. We can't use logic, and it's no use reminding them of potential fallout from their decisions or previous errors of judgment. We've got to get in their minds just as they're about to make a choice. Time perspectives make a big difference in how we value and use our time. When Americans are asked how busy they are, the vast majority report being busier than ever before. They admit to sacrificing their relationships, personal time, and a good night's sleep for their success. Twenty years ago, 60 percent of Americans had sit-down dinners with their families, and now only 20 percent do. But when they're asked what they would do with an eight-day week, they say, "Oh, that'd be great." They would spend that time laboring away to achieve more. They're constantly trying to get ahead, to get toward a future point of happiness. So, it's really important to be aware of how other people think about time. We tend to think, "Oh, that person's really irresponsible," or "That guy's power hungry." But often, what we're looking at is not fundamental differences of personality, but really just different ways of thinking about time. Seeing these conflicts as differences in time perspective. Rather than distinctions of character, can facilitate more effective cooperation between people and get the most out of each person's individual strengths. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about coffee and its importance both in economic and social terms. We think it was first drunk in the Arab world, but there's hardly any documentary evidence of it before the 1500s. Although of course that doesn't mean that people didn't know about it before then. However, there is evidence that coffee was originally gathered from bushes growing wild in Ethiopia, in the northeast of Africa. In the early 16th century, it was being bought by traders, and gradually its use as a drink spread throughout the Middle East.
It's also known that in 1522, in the Turkish city of Constantinople, which was the centre of the Ottoman Empire, the court physician approved its use as a medicine. By the mid-1500s, coffee bushes were being cultivated in the Yemen, and for the next hundred years, this region produced most of the coffee drunk in Africa and the Arab world. What's particularly interesting about coffee is its effect on social life. It was rarely drunk at home, but instead people went to coffee houses to drink it. These people, usually men, would meet to drink coffee and chat about issues of the day. But at the time, this chance to share ideas and opinions was seen as something that was potentially dangerous. And in 1623, the ruler of Constantinople demanded the destruction of all the coffee houses in the city, although after his death, many new ones opened and coffee consumption continued. In the 17th century, coffee drinking spread to Europe, and here too, coffee shops became places where ordinary people, nearly always men, could meet to exchange ideas. Because of this, some people said that these places performed a similar function to universities. The opportunity they provided for people to meet together outside their own homes and to discuss the topics of the day had an enormous impact on social life and many social movements and political developments had their origins in coffeehouse discussions. In the late 1600s, the Yemeni monopoly on coffee production broke down and coffee production started to spread around the world, helped by European colonisation. Europeans set up coffee plantations in Indonesia and the Caribbean, and production of coffee in the colonies skyrocketed. Different types of coffee were produced in different areas, and it's interesting that the names given to these different types, like mocha or java coffee, were often taken from the port they were shipped to Europe from. But if you look at the labour system in the different colonies, there were some significant differences. In Brazil and the various Caribbean colonies, coffee was grown in huge plantations, and the workers there were almost all slaves. But this wasn't the same in all colonies. For example, in Java, which had been colonised by the Dutch, the peasants grew coffee and passed a proportion of this on to the Dutch, so it was used as a means of taxation. But whatever system was used, under the European powers of the 18th century, coffee production was very closely linked to colonisation. Coffee was grown in ever-increasing quantities to satisfy the growing demand from Europe, and it became nearly as important as sugar production, which was grown under very similar conditions. However, coffee prices were not yet low enough for people to drink it regularly at home, so most coffee consumption still took place in public coffee houses, and it still remained something of a luxury item. In Britain, however, a new drink was introduced from China and started to become popular, gradually taking over from coffee, although at first it was so expensive that only the upper classes could afford it. This was tea, and by the late 1700s it was being widely drunk. However, when the USA gained independence from Britain in 1776, they identified this drink with Britain and coffee remained the preferred drink in the USA, as it still is today. So, by the early 19th century, coffee was already being widely produced and consumed. But during this century, production boomed, and coffee prices started to fall. This was partly because new types of transportation had been developed, which were cheaper and more efficient. So now, working people could afford to buy coffee. It wasn't just a drink for the middle classes. And this was at a time when large parts of Europe were starting to work in industries. And sometimes this meant their work didn't stop when it got dark. They might have to continue throughout the night. So the use of coffee as a stimulant became important. It wasn't just a drink people drank in the morning for breakfast. Last week we started looking at reptiles, including crocodiles and snakes. Today. I'd like us to have a look at another reptile, the lizard, and in particular, at some studies that have been done on a particular type of lizard whose Latin name is Teliqua rugosa. This is commonly known as the sleepy lizard because it's quite slow in its movements and spends quite a lot of its time dozing under rocks or lying in the sun. I'll start with a general description. 
Sleepy lizards live in Western and South Australia, where they're quite common. Unlike European lizards, which are mostly small, green and fast-moving, sleepy lizards are brown, but what's particularly distinctive about them is the colour of their tongue, which is dark blue, in contrast with the lining of their mouth, which is bright pink. And they're much bigger than most European lizards. They have quite a varied diet, including insects and even small animals. But they mostly eat plants, of varying kinds. Even though they're quite large and powerful, with strong jaws that can crush beetles and snail shells, they still have quite a few predators. Large birds, like cassowaries, were one of the main ones in the past. But nowadays, they're more likely to be caught and killed by snakes. Actually, another threat to their survival isn't a predator at all, but is man-made. Quite a large number of sleepy lizards are killed by cars when they're trying to cross highways. One study carried out by Michael Freak at Flinders University investigated the methods of navigation of these lizards. Though they move slowly, they can travel quite long distances. And he found that even if they were taken some distance away from their home territory, they could usually find their way back home as long as they could see the sky. They didn't need any other landmarks on the ground. Observations of these lizards in the wild have also revealed that their mating habits are quite unusual. Unlike most animals, it seems that they're relatively monogamous, returning to the same partner year after year. And the male and female also stay together for a long time, both before and after the birth of their young. It's quite interesting to think about the possible reasons for this. It could be that it's to do with protecting their young. You'd expect them to have a much better chance of survival if they have both parents around. But in fact, Observers have noted that once the babies have hatched out of their eggs, they have hardly any contact with their parents. So there's not really any evidence to support that idea. Another suggestion is based on the observation that male lizards in monogamous relationships tend to be bigger and stronger than other males. So maybe the male lizards stay around so they can give the female lizards protection from other males. But again, we're not really sure. Finally, I'd like to mention another study that involved collecting data by tracking the lizards. I was actually involved in this myself. So we caught some lizards in the wild and we developed a tiny GPS system that would allow us to track them and we fixed this onto their tails. Then we set the lizards free again and we were able to track them for 12 days and gather data, not just about their location, but even about how many steps they took during this period. One surprising thing we discovered from this is that there were far fewer meetings between lizards than we expected. It seems that they were actually trying to avoid one another. So why would that be? Well, again, we have no clear evidence. But one hypothesis is that male lizards can cause quite serious injuries to one another. So maybe this avoidance is a way of preventing this. Of self-preservation, if you like but we need to collect a lot more data before we can be sure of any of this. We'll be continuing the series of lectures on memory by focusing on what is called episodic memory and what can happen if this is not working properly. Episodic memory refers to the memory of an event or episode. Episodic memories allow us to mentally travel back in time to an event from the past. Episodic memories include various details about these events. For example, when an event happened and other information, such as the location. To help understand this concept, try to remember the last time you ate dinner at a restaurant. The ability to remember where you ate, who you were with, and the items you ordered are all features of an episodic memory. Episodic memory is distinct from another type of memory called semantic memory. This is the type of factual memory that we have in common with everyone else. That is your general knowledge of the world. To build upon a previous example, remembering where you parked your car is an example of episodic memory. But your understanding of what a car is and how an engine works are examples of semantic memory. 
Unlike episodic memory, semantic memory isn't dependent on recalling personal experiences. Episodic memory can be thought of as a process with several different steps of memory processing, encoding, consolidation, and retrieval. The initial step is called encoding. This involves the process of receiving and registering information which is necessary for creating memories of information or events that you experience. The degree to which you can successfully encode information depends on the level of attention you give to an event while it's actually happening. Being distracted can make effective encoding very difficult. Encoding of episodic memories is also influenced by how you process the event. For example, if you were introduced to someone called Charlie, you might make the connection that your uncle has the same name. Future recollection of Charlie's name is much easier if you have a strategy to help you encode it. Memory consolidation, the next step in forming an episodic memory, is the process by which memories of encoded information are strengthened, stabilized, and stored to facilitate later retrieval. Consolidation is most effective when the information being stored can be linked to an existing network of information. Consolidation makes it possible for you to store memories for later retrieval indefinitely. Forming strong memories depends on the frequency with which you try to retrieve them. Memories can fade or become harder to retrieve if they aren't used very often. The last step in forming episodic memories is called retrieval, which is the conscious recollection of encoded information. Retrieving information from episodic memory depends upon semantic, olfactory, auditory, and visual factors. These help episodic memory retrieval by acting as a prompt. For example, when recalling where you parked your car, you may use the colour of a sign close to where you parked. You actually have to mentally travel back to the moment you parked. There are a wide range of neurological diseases and conditions that can affect episodic memory. These range from Alzheimer's to schizophrenia to autism. An impairment of episodic memory can have a profound effect on individuals' lives. For example, the symptoms of schizophrenia can be reasonably well controlled by medication. However, patients' episodic memory may still be impaired and so they are often unable to return to university or work. Recent studies have shown that computer-assisted games designed to keep the brain active can help improve their episodic memory. Episodic memories can help people connect with others, for instance by sharing intimate details about their past, something individuals with autism often have problems with. This may be caused by an absence of a sense of self. This is essential for the storage of episodic memory and has been found to be impaired in children with autism. Research has shown that treatments that improve memory may also have a positive impact on children's social development. Today we're going to be looking at animals in urban environments, and I'm going to be telling you about some research on how they're affected by these environments. Now, in evolutionary terms, urban environments represent huge upheavals, the sorts of massive changes that usually happen over millions of years. And we used to think that only a few species could adapt to this new environment. One species which is well known as being highly adaptable is the crow, and there have been various studies about how they manage to learn new skills. Another successful species is the pigeon, because they're able to perch on ledges on the walls of city buildings, just like they once perched on cliffs by the sea. But, in fact, 
we're now finding that these early immigrants were just the start of a more general movement of animals into cities and of adaptation by these animals to city life. And one thing that researchers are finding especially interesting is the speed with which they're doing this. We're not talking about gradual evolution here. These animals are changing fast. Let me tell you about some of the studies that have been carried out in this area. So, in the University of Minnesota, a biologist called Emily Snellrude and her colleagues looked at specimens of urbanized small mammals such as mice and gophers that had been collected in Minnesota and that are now kept in museums there. And she looked at specimens that had been collected over the last hundred years, which is a very short time in evolutionary terms. And she found that during that time, these small mammals had experienced a jump in brain size when compared to rural mammals. Now, we can't be sure this means they're more intelligent, but since the sizes of other parts of the body didn't change, it does suggest that something cognitive was going on. And Snellrude thinks that this change might reflect the cognitive demands of adjusting to city life, having to look in different places to find food, for example, and coping with a whole new set of dangers. Then over in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute, there's another biologist called Katerina Miranda, who's done some experiments with blackbirds living in urban and rural areas. And she's been looking not at their anatomy, but at their behavior. So, as you might expect, she's found that the urban blackbirds tend to be quite bold. They're prepared to face up to a lot of threats that would frighten away their country counterparts. But there's one type of situation that does seem to frighten the urban blackbirds, and that's anything new, anything they haven't experienced before. And if you think about it, that's quite sensible for a bird living in the city. Jonathan Atwell, in Indiana University, is looking at how a range of animals respond to urban environments. He's found that when they're under stress, their endocrine systems react by reducing the amount of hormones, such as corticosterone, into their blood. It's a sensible-seeming adaptation. A rat that gets scared every time a subway train rolls past won't be very successful. There's just one more study I'd like to mention, which is by Sarah Parton and her team. And they've been looking at how squirrels communicate in an urban environment and they've found that a routine part of their communication is carried out by waving their tails. You do also see this in the country, but it's much more prevalent in cities, possibly because it's effective in a noisy environment. So, what are the long-term implications of this? One possibility is that we may see completely new species developing in cities. But on the other hand, it's possible that not all of these adaptations will be permanent. Once the animals got accustomed to its new environment, it may no longer need the features it's developed. Today I'd like to continue our discussion of the lives of prominent American writers by talking about Louisa May Alcott, one of the best-known 19th century writers. Alcott is known for her moralistic girls' novels, but she was a much more serious individual than those novels might lead one to believe. She was born in 1832, the daughter of Bronson Alcott, who was one of the founders of the Transcendentalist movement. Bronson Alcott was a philosopher, but not a provider, and the family lived close to poverty. From an early age, Louisa was determined to find a way to improve her family's economic situation. As a teenager, she worked to support her family by taking on a variety of low-paying jobs, including teacher, seamstress, and household servant. Alcott also started writing when she was young. She wrote her first novel when she was just 17 years old, although it wasn't published until many years after her death. It was called The Inheritance. In 1861, the Civil War broke out. Alcott worked as a volunteer, sewing uniforms and bandages for soldiers. The following year, she enlisted as an army nurse. She spent the war years in Washington, nursing wounded soldiers at a military hospital. While working at the hospital, she wrote many letters to her family at home in Massachusetts. After the war, she turned the letters into a book, which was published under the title Hospital Sketches. She also wrote numerous romantic stories, which she sold to magazines. Around this same time, she was offered the opportunity to travel to Europe as the companion to an invalid. When she returned home from Europe in 1866, 
She found her family still in financial difficulty and in need of money, so she went back to writing. Her big break came in 1868 with the publication of her first novel for girls, Little Women. The novel achieved instant success, and the public wanted more. From then on, Alcott supported herself and her family by writing novels for girls. It wasn't the writing she had dreamed of doing, but it earned her a good income. Alcott took care of her family for the rest of her life. In 1878, her youngest sister, May, got married. A year later, May died after giving birth to a daughter. Louisa Alcott raised her sister's orphaned child. In 1882, Bronson Alcott suffered a stroke. Soon after that, Louisa Alcott set up a house for him, her niece, her sister Anna, and Anna's two sons in Boston. Her mother was no longer living by this time. Alcott was still writing novels for girls, including two sequels to Little Women, Little Men and Joe's Boys. The latter was published in 1886. Louisa Alcott had suffered poor health ever since she contracted typhoid fever while working as a war nurse. She died in March of 1888, at the age of 55. She was buried in Concord, Massachusetts. Today I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on the tiger shark. First of all, some background information. The tiger shark, also known as the leopard shark, is often thought to have got its name from its aggressive nature. But in actual fact, it's called that because it has dark bands, similar to those on a tiger's body. It is a huge creature, growing up to lengths of six and a half meters. It can be found just about everywhere throughout the world's temperate and tropical seas, but it is most often found along the coast rather than the open sea. In terms of feeding, tiger sharks tend to be most active at night and are solitary hunters. Their preferred prey includes other sharks, turtles, seabirds, and dolphins, to name but a few. However, it's not uncommon to find garbage in its stomach. This is because it tends to feed in areas such as harbors and river inlets, where there is a lot of human activity. Now to the project itself. We are particularly interested in some studies that have been done in the Rain Island area. Observations here have shown that there is a large population of tiger sharks present in the summer during the turtle nesting season. However, during the winter months, the sharks disappear. So we decided to do some of our own research there. The first step was to tag a number of sharks so that we could follow their movements. To do this, we first needed to catch the sharks. Early in the morning, we baited lines with large bits of fish and set them in place. These lines were then checked every three or four hours. If no sharks were caught, the baits were replaced. Once a shark had been caught on one of the baited hooks, it was pulled in close to the boat and secured so that we could carry out a number of brief activities to aid our research. This usually took no more than about ten minutes and was carried out as carefully as possible to minimize any stress to the shark. Each of the tiger sharks that we caught was measured and fitted with an identification tag, and also a small amount of tissue was taken for genetic studies. For some larger sharks over three meters long, we also inserted into the belly a special acoustic tag capable of sending satellite signals, while on other large sharks we attached a camera to the dorsal fin to enable us to study the behavior and habitat use of the sharks. After this, the shark was released and we were able to follow its movements. So what was the purpose of all this tagging? Well, while we were already familiar with some aspects of the tiger shark's behavior and food sources, what we hoped to do in this project was to see exactly what factors affected the migration patterns of tiger sharks and whether it was, in fact, food, weather, and reproductive needs. These are some of our findings. On February 21st, a large female shark, whom we named Natalie, was attracted to our research boat at the northern tip of Rain Island and fitted with one of the satellite tags I've just mentioned. No transmissions were received from Natalie between April 2nd and April 29th, indicating that she didn't surface to feed during this period. The area in which she was last reported is very shallow, suggesting that she may have changed her feeding preferences during this period to focus on prey found on the sea floor. We also made a number of other discoveries, thanks to the various transmitters we used. It seems that tiger sharks move back and forth between the ocean floor and the surface quite often. 
This may help the sharks conserve energy while they swim, but it probably also helps them hunt, since this movement back and forth maximizes its chances of not being detected by its prey until the last minute. So far, our findings have not been conclusive. However, we have gained some very interesting insights into the behavior of tiger sharks and are now hoping to develop our research further. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the science faculty. As you may know, my field of study is neurobiology, so you may be wondering what I have to say to those of you who are studying physics or chemistry or geology, even those of you who intend to become doctors. In fact, what I have to say is aimed especially at those who wish to enter the medical profession, though the main point applies to all of you. And what is my main point? Basically, it is that you shouldn't get stuck in too narrow a specialization. What I mean is, too often doctors and scientists become experts on one small aspect of their subject and neglect the rest. Perhaps you have heard the joke about a doctor being introduced to another doctor as an expert on the nose. Oh yes, said the other doctor. Which nostril? I know that more and more it is necessary to specialize because when you finish your studies, you have to find a place in the job market. But I do believe that it is damaging both to you personally and to the profession. You may be surprised to know how many physicians in the past were men of wide culture. Many were interested in the humanities, from the arts to literature to philosophy. A surprising number of them, from Rabelais to William Carlos Williams, became poets, novelists, and playwrights. Men of science have written clearly and intelligently about society, psychology, and politics. This tradition is not dead. Today, such eminent scientists as Stephen Jay Gould, Jared Diamond, and Richard Dawkins are well known as popularizers of science while maintaining high standards. But more of them in a minute. I'm not saying that while you are studying anatomy, you should sign up for a course in English literature, but reading a few works of fiction in your own time will show you the human mind, just as your anatomy classes show you the human body. Science faculties and medical schools, it seems to me, now largely ignore this human dimension. Furthermore, the study of medicine, and psychology for that matter, is largely about what has gone wrong with the body and the mind. That is, it mostly deals with the abnormal. So, to try and correct this situation, if only in a small way, I have come up with some extra reading for you to do. Don't worry, I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't think they were enjoyable as well as interesting. The first on my list I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you haven't read it. It's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, don't turn your noses up at it just because it's now officially a school book and is written to entertain as well as inform. In fact, I've found it a very good bedside book. Next come a couple of the writers I mentioned earlier. Any collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould is worth reading. He writes clearly in a language non-scientists can easily understand. In fact, a lot of his essays are responses to questions about science from the general public. He's also entertaining on the subject of baseball. Perhaps you should start with Gould's Wonderful Life. He writes brilliantly about natural history and shows how much imagination and excitement there is in scientific discovery. Then there's Jared Diamond's The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee, which shows us how close we are to the apes and forces us to look at some of the darker aspects of human nature. After reading it, you won't forget your animal ancestry, but don't let that put you off. It's very readable. You're probably saying to yourselves, just a minute, these are all science books. What about the fiction? I'll come to those in a later lecture. At the moment, I'm just trying to get you to read away from your chosen field of study. However, I will recommend one work of fiction now, though it might come as a bit of a surprise. If it does, it means you haven't read it. The book is The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. I can see I have surprised you. 
Well, it is in fact the first fictional response to Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Yes, it is a children's book, but full of surreal fantasy and wit. The fourth, no, the fifth book on the list is a biography, The Emperor of Scent by Chandler Burr. To my mind, it's not particularly well written, but it is a fascinating story. It is about Luca Turin, a biophysicist who becomes an expert on perfume, and about how he missed getting the Nobel Prize. If any of you are thinking of a career in scientific research, this book might make you think again. It's a very tough dog-eat-dog -dog business. Which brings us to the book that inspired Kingsley's Water Babies, that classic of the genre, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. If you haven't read it already, perhaps you shouldn't be here. If you have, it won't hurt to read it again. Or if you prefer, read his The Voyage of the Beagle, which as well as being of interest to any natural historian or anyone interested in scientific method, also makes a great travel book. Well, I think that's enough to be going on with, and I can see that it's time to finish up. So please bear in mind, throughout whatever course you are studying, not to neglect other aspects of your wider, non-academic education.